Okay, this is lecture number 30 in the series on creating an international sustainable civilization. This section of the lectures is about prophecy, the cultural icons of all the traditions in Panchasila, the, the most prominent of the world religions, plus Greek humanism, uh, unity and diversity, uh, gaining wisdom through deliberation and government involvement in lifting people up into the middle class. And then the responsibility of people to use their privileges or their opportunities they were given to help their fellow citizen move up into the middle class. And then within the context of a sustainable society. So um, I think Internationally, we should all be on board with those basic principles. And so I am just showing some of the historical context for all of this. And then also its connection with contemporary systems thinking so we can also move forward the way we really ought to move forward into a new paradigm. So it's both reaching back into the past and forward into the future. Okay, so this was um, this is the lecture series. All right, so this one is on Hinduism. Um, Hinduism, first of all, has multiple creation stories because they don't really care about how you think of the origin of the universe. It's not as important as the process of this unfolding of energy and this relationship between the different energies in the universe. So very different from the Judeo-Christian Muslim and in a, in a very important way. So it's important to me that the creation stories represent what is an important obstacle that has to be overcome in understanding an authentic, humanistic religious pluralism. So Aristotle's position is what you call monism. There is a fundamental energizing type of energy in the universe. Now Hinduism has these three basic forces. So again, with monism, there's one force and complementarity. So there's both a unity and a multiplicity, a diversity. Just like in Panchasila, unity and diversity. Just like in the United Nations, uh, United States uh, concept of out of many, one, all right? So in the Hindu, there's three forces, Brahma, creation, Vishnu, preservation, and Shiva, destruction. Brahma is the fundamental one creation, the emergence of the universe into being and then more and more complex types of being. And then in um, Vishnu is as, as the universe unfolds and especially once human beings emerge and if they start creating bad karma, then uh, Brahma, Vishnu, is the incarnation of Brahma to remind people, to bring them back to the positive karma. And um, Shiva is the destruction of Maya, material um, matter that gets in the way of the life of the spirit. Um, in the Greeks, they have four fundamental forces, chaos, and then eros is the creative force, thanatos is the destructive force, and Gaia is the earth. So this big drama between eros and thanatos plays itself out on Gaia. But um, on Gaia, okay, so that the original force was Gaia, life, the creator of life. She gives birth 
to Uranus, sky, the, the male. So the male is secondary. He exists to protect the female. He doesn't exist to prove his own machismo <laughs> and dominate. And that's what he did, Uranus. He wouldn't allow his son to take over power. He wanted to stonewall it. And that created problems right from the beginning. So it's about the male energy, not, you know, the terrible evil when male energy becomes its own goal, power for its own sake. It leads to a lot of destruction and a lot of harming of Gaia and the birth force. But anyway, so in Hindu, there's these basic forces. Um, whereas in the Judeo-Christian Muslim, there's this claim that there was the sons of Abraham were somehow special. They had a special place in world history. And there's a personal God who has a specific agenda for the sons of Abraham. And I think if you take that literally, it's fatal. <laughs> you know, we will destroy ourselves. You know, Israel and Palestine will lead to a nuclear holocaust and will destroy life. Or what's happened since then is that Christians think that somehow they're the city on the hill, they're special because they're part of this Judeo-Christian Muslim. Anytime somebody thinks because of some condition within which they're born that they didn't control, it wasn't their choice, has made them morally better. That's fatal. <laughs> because virtue is a way of life. It's not an ideology. It's not the fact that you were born Jewish and the Bible says the Jews are special and blah, blah. That's an ideology. But that's where monism comes in again. The idea of monism does not favor anybody, but it does favor that there is an underlying unifying force. And that's what determines when good karma is getting corrupted, right? Bad karma. And that is what determines when Vishnu has to come back to try and lift the karma from bad to good. There is an ultimate good, force of good, which is all of reality. It's energy, pure energy. And that's what Aristotle's God is pure energy. But energy occurs in this ordered way. Okay. Um, when the universe declines, negative karma, Vishnu comes in some form, some form to renew it bring it back to positive karma. So that would be, the different forms were a boar, an elephant, a tortoise. Um, the ninth incarnation is Krishna. And then on this Hindu view, you could have Socrates, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad. They're all prophets that could also be understood as incarnations of Vishnu, meant to return the world to positive karma and remind people how to live. So it's not hard to develop even an ideology of how all these traditions really have the same basic intuition and the same basic virtues. But you have to reject a literalist ideology. And there's plenty of motive to do so because it's sort of intuitively obvious that virtue is people, that when you know a person who is virtuous, they know you know that they are virtuous. And you know that people can hide behind ideologies. And they can even deceive themselves into thinking they're more virtuous than they are just because they're Christian or they're Muslim or something. It's not hard to understand that. A child understands that. It's only as adults that we get obsessed with a set of words or we hide behind a set of words 
or we believe somebody who's got a set of words that they use to cover up their vice, you know? It's only adults. Children, you know, there's an expression out of the mouth of babes. Like kids will just flat out say what's right in front of their face that adults have learned not to say, and you know, and in a lot of cases, not even to believe because they've brainwashed themselves so much. So I think that, um, so if Mr. Modi, from what I know, he uses Hinduism to, as a weapon, to weaponize, to um, demonize Muslims. So anybody from Indonesia, a Muslim should know that, okay, I totally disagree with Mr. Modi, Modi about that, but how is it that Islam could be used to do the same thing in relationship to the Chinese Indonesians or to the Christian Indonesians or Buddhist or Hindu? I mean, you should be able to see analogies and that's the kind of education in analogies that humanities disciplines were trying to teach your capacity for that, for analogies, for the sake of understanding the real human good, true virtue underneath all of these other world of appearances. Um, okay. So the Hinduism that I like, what I like about it's old. And so it has a lot of insights. And it's very tolerant. It's why Modi, there's no way this could be, you know, any sort of meaningful Hinduism. They have four paths to God, four paths of life. So we all have this piece of the infinite inside of us. So in the Bible, which Muslims, the Old Testament, um, human beings were made in the image of God. Okay, well, Hindus have this, infinite within, this piece of the universe. Um, the goal of life is to live out our lives in touch with that infinite. Well, you know, the analogy is in touch with God, right? And so in the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, it's a vertical, right? God is out there somewhere. And the Hindu, God is in here and out there. It's the same energy. And in the Greek, God is divine noose and the human noose. So it's a microcosm in a macrocosm. So the human noose is different than the divine noose because we have to make decisions about what to do with our bodies and what to do with our emotions. And God doesn't worry about that. Uh, so we have, we are minds in bodies we have to train our minds to think globally but to act locally um, we have to incarnate our idea of the good and because of our limitations our severe limitations our way of living out the good is going to be specific to our cultural situation or our geographical situation or whatever but we still have grounds for discussion and argument. If there were no common foundation, we cannot possibly think that one person's way of life or choice is better than another. And we tend to judge too soon. We think somebody is worse because they're not like us, but that's where you need the training to know, no, no, <laughs> there's the stuff that's relative. And then there's the stuff that's the underlying perennial philosophy. So in the Hindu, uh, there is this jiva, getting in touch with it. How do you do that? Some people are young souls. They seek pleasure in life. They will die and be reincarnated to a higher level. So if you see a 43-year-old man driving some red-hot sports car, uh, you know he's he's reverting to uh, trying to be a teenager again. So a modern psychologist would call it, you know, midlife crisis. His testosterone levels are going down. He wants to prove he's still virile like he was when he was young. Um, a Hindu would say, 
he just has a young soul. He just uh, is never going to grow out of teenagerhood in this incarnation. Maybe the next one, right? You just go, he's a young soul. You don't judge them, just let it be. So Hinduism really isn't judgmental, which again, Mr. Modi, <laughs> it would not represent that tradition. Um, just like Mr. Marif said, you should tolerate, if you're a good Muslim, you should tolerate atheists. And um, as well as Indonesia, uh, a Hindu is part of religious pluralism. You respect them uh, as equally. I mean, there's no marginalization at all. Um, in Hinduism, you don't judge somebody who seeks pleasure, but you do think they're a young soul. They just, they don't get it, but that's okay. I can't make them get it. Um, so the next incarnation, right? A slightly older soul will seek worldly success. Um, they they want to be successful in a way that's measurable. So you, you get rich, you get powerful, you get to be an influencer, um, you get pleasures, whatever it is you happen to want. And so Mr. Murdoch, all he cares about is he's rich, he's successful. He doesn't care that he corrupted the minds of people. He corrupted their emotions. He got them to be loyal to Donald Trump, who he doesn't, Murdoch doesn't even like. But he's a good businessman. He can make money off of manipulating public opinion. He doesn't care how he made the money. He cares that he made the money. And that means he's successful. And that's his idea of the ultimate goal of human life. Well, a Hindu would say he's a young soul. It would, a Hindu would also say you shouldn't you shouldn't be a sucker, right? You can you can think your way out of that. Um, they might never change, right? And that's their thing. Some people renounce the world and they turn toward the Atman. They just say, I don't want pleasure. It comes and goes. I don't want success. It comes and goes. Um, and I'm always competing. You're never rich enough. You're never glamorous enough. You never have enough pleasure. It just never ends. I don't want it. Now, you might have tried it before you get to the point where you say, I don't want it. Or you might sort of be a kid that never does want that. I never wanted any of that stuff. I thought, well, I made myself miserable overeating a few times and decided I really didn't want to do that. I don't like throwing up because I ate too much. Um, and then with success, I thought, you could be the CEO of a company. You're entirely dependent on other people because you depend on all these other people to do their jobs and to do them well and not to sexually harass anybody. I just thought success in this world was slavery because you depend on other people. So my idea, you know, of liberation or bliss or freedom, I could have a free mind, right? And to me, teaching philosophy, wow, <laughs> that's freedom. You can start anywhere. You can tolerate your students. You can, your students can start anywhere with the worldview. I just ask them, well, what is it? And then I hold them accountable for what they think. And if they think their worldview is to screw other people, cheat other people, and they can't even follow the golden rule, that's a problem because that's not coherent. You don't want anybody else to cheat you. You're living a contradiction. And that's blows up. I mean, usually it self-destructs, but it's intellectually incoherent and it's conflicted. It's not the very fact that you know it's incoherent. The very fact that you know 
you're not fundamentally different from the person you're cheating means that you are naturally, you cannot have integrity. You cannot be a flourishing person unless you have empathy. Um, so these basic perennial philosophy is that you do have empathy. By nature, we understand that our common humanity and by nature, we can think in universals. We can think about being another human being we don't even know. We can think about the laws that we need to make so that everybody would be, have a middle, would everyone has flourished because we can imagine being another person living under that law. And it's not difficult. It's just amazing to me how many people find reasons to justify violating the golden rule or making laws that clearly they would not want to live under. So I think Mr. Cheney, when he was a vice president, what he really believed was the meaning of having power, the essence of power, is that you can make laws that force other people to do things that they cannot do to you. That's power. <laughs> and to me, that is corrupt. And it's self-destructive. People don't live under that for very long. And Mr. Cheney might have gotten away with as much money and power as he ever wanted, although he now he wants it through his daughter, his daughter's going to do it all, all the same stuff for him. And that's his extension of his own ego, I think. But um, it's self-destructive and it's done a lot of destruction to our country, definitely. And Americans should know that. And I don't think they do know that. But ignorance is not bliss. Um, anyway, so if you're on the path of pleasure or on the path of success. Um, it's incoherent. That's what a Greek would say. There's no way we were naturally meant to be this way. But if you're in a Hindu context, it will run its course and they'll die. And then maybe next time around, they'll have an older soul and they'll get wiser. <laughs> but Sometimes during this life, they turn away and they turn toward the first step is philanthropy. So Bill Gates did that. He had a child. He got married. He had a kid. His father, he was still extremely competitive. He was still on the second, the path of success. He thought, you know, there's somebody else competing with me. I got to outdo them. And he was the richest man in the world. And he was the stingiest. He was not generous. And his dad interviewed with Newsweek or something and said, well, we try to tell Trey, you know, that, hey. And Andy does have a kid and he realizes, wow, the human brain is way more complicated than a computer. <laughs> yeah, really, Mr. Gates, yeah. He might have thought, gee, now I know why not everybody wants to sit in the office all day staring at four computers. Yeah, people actually fall in love and they actually have kids and all this other stuff. Uh, just recently, his daughter graduated either undergrad or med school. And she's going to med school. Or she's gotten through med school. And I think the reason is that they used to take her to Africa and... Um, make her part of the Gates Foundation grants and talk to the people who receive those grants. So I assume that she wants to spend some of her time as a doctor in Africa. And there were these social media posts saying, gee, she's the richest kid. If I were her, I'd be on a yacht. You know, how come she's going to school? And it just shows how incredibly corrupt our society is. I would be so humiliated if my child couldn't think of anything to do with their life if they had money but to sit on a yacht. Again, that would be the, the path of pleasure. But I, I guess I would think that is not natural. 
I wouldn't, you know, I'm not a Hindu, I guess. I wouldn't just say, oh, well, young soul, I guess, you know. I would, I would worry about that. I would worry that did I send the signal that that's what I cared about? Or did I not care enough? And so my child resents too much anti-pleasure. Or is it just the culture, just the social media? And she's too much influenced by her peers and that uh, her phone has just destroyed her ability to reflect and stand back and think. I don't know, but that's, um, but a Hindu would not go there. They would say, well, Bill Gates decided he wanted to become a philanthropist. And then he wanted, his first step was to put a computer in every library in Africa. <laughs> Plus, they'd have to buy his software. It's like, wait a sec, can you get a tax break for that? You know, I mean, he said that when he was growing up, he really wanted access to computers and he wanted to make sure every African kid had access to what he needed access to. Well, then... Somebody pointed out to him and Melinda that, you know, if a kid is dying of malaria, they don't really feel like going to the library and using a computer. <laughs> and so then they figured out, oh, yeah, well, we got to work on like infectious diseases and health care for pregnant women and babies. And so they finally sort of caught on that, hey, you know, if you're going to actually help people, People have, people's lives have a beginning, a middle, and end. You sort of have to help them all the way along. Um, and, I, you know, he learns, though, right? One thing about him, I don't like to idealize him or demonize him, right? He is who he is. And he did learn. He changed. He flipped into a philanthropy. And then he changed from less enlightened philanthropy perhaps self-interested, economically interested philanthropy to a more enlightened, a serious consideration of what the big problems are. I still wonder why it took him 30, almost 40 years, 38 years before he caught on in 2006, whereas I'm about the age he was, I caught on in 1968. That's really important that someone that smart and that talented in engineering did not get any message about going green because that's what we should have done and we'd be way ahead of the Chinese at this point. But we're not. And the Chinese are catching up and going past us. And that's what we need to work on. But, um, but Bill Gates was uh, is on the the path of duty and then the last path is that you even say uh people you know i donate this money and then it doesn't work and nobody cares and it seems like it's wasted and the world isn't going to change or look i've put other people in charge of all my money they can keep up with the latest trends i trust them um i'm just going to to renounce. I'm going to get in touch with the Atman. I want to get in touch with my deepest self. I don't want to have to control things or solve things. And so that's the turn toward the Atman. Okay. And once you decide on that path, there's also four paths to God. So all the Indian spiritual exercises are devoted seriously to this practical aim. And so that's where Houston Smith says, even though Hinduism has this stereotype that it's mystical and it's otherworldly and all that, you know, he's saying, no, as a matter of fact, it recognizes all the other paths of life, but it also recognizes there is this human desire to stay in touch with the higher power, which all of these traditions represent different versions of that natural desire, because we have it. That's why we desire to get in touch with it. It's there. Um, 
And there's different paths to God. So, but Houston Smith says that all of these four paths that the Hindus have worked out are realistic, matter of fact, and practical minded systems of thought and training ever set up by the human mind. How to come to Brahman and remain in touch with the Brahman, how to become identified with the Brahman, how to live out of the Brahman. So all your actions come from this Atman center, how to become divine while still on earth, how to be reborn while on the earthly plane. This is the quest that has inspired and deified the human spirit in India throughout the ages. So every one of these traditions, Jesus is the incarnation of God. And, we, and we're reborn in the spirit. And all those notions of living a life that's driven by the spirit, not by the body. So all these traditions have, here's a life driven by bodily desires, physical desires, whatever. Here's one driven by spiritual. Now the Greeks have spirituals living for the sake of justice or truth or beauty, something and all of those together make up a flourishing society. Now, the Hindu is that you live out from the Atman, and uh, there are four different paths to the Atman, all based on empirically tested uh, rituals, whatever. They're, they're very acute, very astute about the human psyche. So the path of knowledge is that the Atman is energy. It's the path of intense reflection. And you use language that never refers to your personal ego or to pleasure. You're always thinking in this more cosmic way. And even the way you use language is cosmic. Um, the path of love, God is personified. So all the hundreds of deities, gods, goddesses, animals, that someone can get connected with. They make statues. Uh, they're not, they are just images of the Atman. So people who are on the path of love have to apologize for having an image. And they have to say, uh, I know you aren't uh, a person or an animal, but I have to relate to you in order to get in touch with the Atman. And those are people that often are drawn to the spiritual life through relationships to other people. So Krishna, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, Muhammad, the prophets were all personifications of this Atman. Then there's the path of action. And that's where people say, you show me that you're in touch by what you do. Um, and that path of action can be connected to knowledge. So you're reflecting and you're acting on your reflections, or they can be connected to love and you're acting in relationships with other people. And the choices you make, your daily routine is either primarily lived out in relation to other people or primarily lived out in relationship to um, knowledge. So I'm ever since I was little, I was on that path of knowledge. I told my sister when I was eight years old, I thought God was energy. God wasn't a person. <laughs> so yeah, obviously I like studying ancient philosophy because it reminds me of what I've thought about at least since I was eight years old. I actually think most kids think about these things too. It just gets covered up in the midst of all their daily life. Sometimes in our society, of course, we're determined to distract people from that because when people really are that way, they, they don't consume things and they don't want to go to war and they don't buy into the way our economy works or the way our political system works or anything. So, of course, you don't want a kid growing up like that They'll be maladaptive, you know, they'll be weird. Um, 
But, you know, a Hindu would say, no, they'll be in touch with the Atman. They'll actually know the truth underneath all of these illusions. So, you know, the Hindus are on to something here. And then there was the path of psychophysical exercise or yoga, concentration. There are four stages of life. So this is like Confucius, if you remember, he said, when I was 15, I dedicated myself to study. And when I was 30, my feet hit the ground. When I was 40, I could start here, the, you know, becoming, having integrity. And then he moves toward higher and higher levels of integrity. Well, so what is it in Hindu? The student, the householder, retirement, and detachment. So, so householder, you know, your family, work, civic responsibilities, church, uh, joining all these institutions, running all these institutions. Then with retirement, you step back. In Hinduism, you really try to detach yourself. Whereas in the US, what do people do in retirement? Oh, I'm gonna travel, I'm gonna do all this stuff that I couldn't do before because I was working. So in the US, it's all about doing. <laughs> you know, you are what you do. That's not true in Hinduism. You are, your being, you know, your success in life is determined by your ability to stay attached to the Atman. So when you retire, you separate yourself more, and then ultimately you detach yourself entirely, you become a beggar. And so a successful Hindu adult would be like somebody who, you know, your former teacher knocks on your door and begs for rice. And that would be that your teacher was sacred and was an authentic spiritual teacher, no matter what topic they were teaching, they were in touch with the Atman. And you can tell because they became a beggar. They became a complete non-entity in the world of Maya or illusion. And they became uh, very, very in touch with the Atman and liberated from all the distractions of this life. Okay, so you can compare that to the U.S., the values, what we think of as successful stages of life. Then we have the four stations in life. So these are the seers, certain people, love, ideas. Um, they're the yogis or the people on the path of reflection. They're the religious leaders. They have, they're given time, but not a lot of money because they don't really want money, they want time. They don't wanna have to live in that time-driven householder, worker, organizational founder, manager, all that stuff. They need time to reflect and come up, create things from that point of view of reflection. Then there's the administrators. They have no time, but they have money and power because they have the most responsibility. Um, they're the ones engaged with creating institutions, uh, running institutions, creating laws, enforcing laws. And they are the ones, because they have so much privilege and so much ability, because they have that calling, if they're corrupt, they should be punished most severely, right? Usually in a corrupt society, the managers on top, when they are corrupt, they just get a golden parachute and move to the next company. Whereas the people on the bottom have to go to jail or something. The rich folk can pay a lawyer and not have to go to jail. So that's not the way it should be. That just creates more bad karma. So the way the system works, I mean, the way the Hindus would teach the system is that if you are an administrator, you do get paid more, but you get punished more if you abuse your power because everybody depends on you to, to run these institutions well. Then there are the producers. They have less responsibility and accountability. These are people who really, their happy life 
is to have a 40 hour a week job, clock in, clock out, go home, raise their kids, be a coach, be a sports coach for grade school, junior high, high school, volunteer, be a Girl Scout leader, a Boy Scout leader, you name it, right? Um, and that's their ideal life. That's where they feel at home, in touch with the Atman. And then the laborers, the untouchable. So this is, um, India is notorious, right, for having this caste system. And Houston Smith is always fair. He gives the each tradition the benefit of the doubt. So he says, at least they didn't have slavery. You know, every society has to decide what to do with who does those really menial tasks. Now in the US today, even the most menial tasks aren't that bad, right? I mean, not as bad as they've been in the past. Um, but still, are people stuck in those lower level dead end jobs or do we provide uh, opportunity for upward mobility? But the, the Hindus had untouchability. All right. So how did this get corrupted? The caste system in theory isn't so bad, um, but because kids do, right? I think kids do have different callings. They have different paths to God, or they have different sense of being at home in the world, what they want to do, or they really feel in touch with the universe, what's inside of them, what's outside, relating to other people. There is kind of a certain kind of way of life that really resonates with them. But, you know, you might be a Brahmin, but you have a child who's really a born producer. You have to let them live that life. Or you're a born administrator, but you really have a child that should never be running an organization. They should be doing menial labor because they really don't have the interest I mean, there are people who just like to be outside. They will take a much lower standard of income so they can work outdoors. Anyway, what happens is the castes with privilege have children and they do not allow for their children to be in a lower caste. And so then those children inherit all of that privilege and then they abuse it, they become arrogant exactly like what Aristotle says in book four of the ethics, exactly what happened in Europe with the Aristotelians, exactly what happened, you know, in Confucius with the emperors. This is an old story, right? So what well, originally is a decent idea that when you have children, you have to let them follow their sense of calling. What they get, what they get, What's gratifying to them when they're actually doing it? When do you lose a sense of time because you're so engaged in something? And then what is your society? What sort of degree do you have to get? And how do you live it out in a social context? So for example, you might really like little kids, but then you get sexually abused or your friend does. Well, then you think, okay, that passion I had for little kids is now becoming more extreme in relationship to people who are vulnerable, who've been abused, right? So it was that vulnerability in a kid that before this happened, it would just be helping them develop, flourish. Now, what really I'm passionate about is helping wounded people overcome their wounds. So that would be the distinction I make is your calling, what you do before there's any obstacles. And then your destiny is when it hits uh, the society and when it hits particular events or your country's going a certain direction, that natural calling gets triggered to be doing something other than just you might have been doing 
if there weren't any major problems. Our society has so many problems now that for my grandchildren, I'm sure they will find some horrible flaw in the society that they will respond to. But first they have to figure out what is it that they originally feel called to do before they can really connect it to solving one of the many problems that we are passing on to them. All right, so the conclusion with Hinduism, it's possible to climb life's mountain from any side, but when the top is reached, the trails converge. All right, so you have this picture, we're all aiming to be in touch with the universe, but we all start in different parts of this mountain and we don't see each other and we develop these different rituals or ideologies to get us higher and higher to, in the spiritual life. At base, in the foothills of theology, ritual, and organizational structure, the religions are dis distinct. Difference in culture, history, geography, collective temperament all make for a diverse starting point, and that's good. It adds richness to the totality of the human venture. Is life not more interesting for the varied contributions of Confucianists, Taoists, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, and Christians? Beyond these differences, the same goal beckons. And so this, like, this is straight out of Panchasila number one. It's straight out of the conference at the Vatican Academy. There's just many, many people coming together. And then the other thing that's obvious but not stated as forthrightly here is sustainability. Every one of those traditions um, condemns greed, condemns the treatment of nature uh, for human satisfaction of human greed, definitely. Hinduism's role in the creation of an international environmental civilization today. While there are metaphysical, ethical, anthropological, and social disagreements among the world religions, a synthesis of the key concepts and precepts from each of them pertaining to conservation could become, should become a foundation for a global environmental ethics. The principle of sanctity of life is clearly ingrained in the Hindu religion. Western colonialism led to the exploitation of resources. Hindus today should revive their ancient cultural values and combine them with current science and interfaith. So I quoted from um, the same article when I started uh, long ago in a number of lectures a long time ago on the uh, religious pluralism. All right. Hinduism and women's equality. The Hindu notion of the divine immanence and thus sacredness in all living things, especially of all humans, lays the foundation for its most fundamental ethical principle of ahimsa or nonviolence. There's a tendency in all religions to minimize their role that social structures play in people's lives. Often nonviolence is the thought, um, is thought of as a purely personal attitude uh, and accomplishment that leaves structural violence the violence embedded in and acted out by social institutions without criticism, resistance, or reform. So it's important if you are a good religious leader or believer to also be a social critic and be involved in social justice as part of your path of action. So for some people, that won't be their primary path, but that should be part of a complete life. In India, Hindu parents of daughters were expected to give their future husbands a dowry. When the in-laws do not think it's enough, many women die in kitchen fires, supposedly kitchen fires, so the husband can get a new wife and another dowry. The dowry was outlawed in India, but it still exists. Dowry plays into the conspicuous consumption aspirations that increasingly possess the hearts and minds of Indian rural and urban populations. The commodification of value has taken over the world. Social media has made it a lot worse. In India too, the value of a human person depends more and more 
on the pile of stuff one owns and displays to others. Um, yeah, and this was written way before um, uh, the internet and all that. Um, it's been, you know, increasing over time, but it's just had quantum leaps since there. Conspicuous consumption is not a materialism, but a misplaced spiritual quest to find in finite temporal things the satisfaction and fulfillment that can only be grasped in liberation from desire. And I would say in living for the sake of something greater than yourself. That's what we really need to do to have a satisfying life. Hinduism has traditionally distinguished between two types of sacred texts. What is heard, the oral nature of Hinduism um, that are considered to be revelation like the Vedas and the other one, and that, that which is remembered and written texts that are sacred but of human origin. These texts can be interpreted they reflect social and historical conditions of their origin and can be criticized and transformed as new circumstances demand. Same in Islam. We have that tradition of it's jihad, which is taking interpreting the Quran and the tradition and the teachings. Same with Jesus, same with, you know, all these traditions have the oral tradition, the the tradition that's written in your heart that comes out in, when you talk, when you live, when you reflect, when you have friendships, when you're interacting with people, and then the tradition written on in paper, and that can be manipulated. It can be, a person can know a lot about the text, but not know, not live a good life, but it also can be interpreted and applied. So that's what all the traditions have that we have to get on board. If the Brahma is the infinite, both external and internal, there are no distinctions between male and female, race, class, and even animals and plants contain the Atman. Hinduism should not be sexist or racist or classist. The prevailing ethic of the Brahman heritage remains andro androcentric and even misogynistic. So the tradition still has um, this corruption in it. This problem is true for all the world's traditions, including Aristotle. It's possible to distinguish between the human spirit or mind, the, the perennial view based on the human condition, and the blindnesses of those who wrote the text, text and interpret the text. So the punchline of this one is to present just the basic foundations of Hinduism, the basic patterns, how they're very similar, um, the perennial philosophy underlying them, the way that current political operatives are definitely weaponizing these religions and the way they refer to them and use them is not at all the original idea. We need to get that straight because if you go back to the real foundation, we, we need to integrate it with systems thinking to create a sustainable civilization. We, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, but right now, publicly in the newspaper, all we get is the bathwater. And so I'm trying to present what really was the inspiration behind all of these traditions.